I see there's no way around negative real rates over the next six to seven years. So another higher, re you know, higher inflation uh, is inevitable because we're going to have to print our way out, inflate our way out of the debt crisis. We have a debt crisis, we have a credit crisis, and then we're, so if there's a bond crisis and a debt crisis, there's going to be a currency crisis. There's going to be a debasement. So I want. Uh, allocation to hard assets. Obviously, I'm very biased towards precious metals, less so towards Bitcoin, not anti-Bitcoin, but for the type of portfolio that I would want, it's going to be more weighted towards precious metals in general and gold in particular. Perversely, I think when we have rate cuts inevitable and more inflation, equities could continue to have a tailwind. We have to keep in mind we're looking seven years out in the next six weeks, but the irony is with, with equities in, in an inflationary scenario, then it's okay, uh, how do you pick those equities? And I would stay away from the, the version of the Magnificent Seven right now. I think they're massively overvalued and they will continue to be. I would look for better value. Uh, you know, I was reading the other day about something, that the current S&P is trading at seven and a half times the global equity index. So we're trading seven and a half times greater than we already are in the rest of the world stock markets. And yet that can still go higher, especially in the next 10 to 24 months if we do get the rate cuts that I foresee and projected. So I would look for value. I would look, I do think there's going to be more reshoring, you know, not just make America great again, but there's going to be reshoring of manufacturing, which we've outsourced uh, really for decades. Uh, America's going to have to make a choice, Canada too, to reshore manufacturing. We've outsourced the American dream to China since 2000. And so I think there's an opportunity there to pick good industrials. Uh, like Lou Groman, I see a good play in even the infrastructure for electricity. For, that's certainly with the Bitcoin, so that would be necessary, but for other reasons too. So I would definitely have that type of allocation, definitely with inflation in mind. And also keep in mind, and this is the former naive hedge fund manager of the dot-com era, uh, and the things I learned in the dot-com lottery ticket when I had on IPOs, and another thing I learned in the crisis in 2008. It's not just you know, what your, your, your sexy stock, your sexy sector, your sexy pick's gonna be lucky or intelligent. It's how you manage that portfolio. And the one thing, when I hit that lottery ticket, was a family office guy, and then merged with other family offices, there was always a debate about what's your, what's your goal? Is it, you know, keep, keep, keep beating Jeremy Siegel's 8%, keep beating inflation, return, return, return. At a certain point, depending on where you are in the spectrum, it's also preserve, protect, preserve, protect. So you gotta think about what's your, what's your goal. I'm not against speculation, I'm not against reaching for more return or yield, but it's gonna be a dangerous world to find yield on that risk branch, you gotta be careful. So the lesson I learned from allocating to much better portfolio managers than I was, uh, the three biggest risks, I think, in a portfolio is over-concentration, and whatever that asset is, no matter what you're biased, there's a massive risk and concentration risk. Leverage is a major risk. Be careful of your own use or your manager's use or your, your expert's use of leverage. And uh, timing risk. I, mean, you know, I know we're trying to project seven years out, but it's very hard to time a move. And so you want to have a portfolio that you know, addresses those key risks. So it's not just what, it's also how. But clearly, uh, the inflation theme is on our mind. I want assets that can't be created out of thin air, basically, and can't be manufactured out of, no out of nothing. And uh, you know, as a European American, and the stories of World War II, and the grandparents and their grandparents, it, even before I even understood protection and understood preservation as a key goal, it was always gold, land, art. It's kind of a joke in Switzerland, but it's actually not so funny now. And I think these other things we can think about is assets that can't be manufactured willy-nilly. No, I, I love the simplicity, man. Steak and push-ups, that's what I say, keep it simple. Uh, on the reshoring trend, though, um, pulling American operations out of China, where do you see those going? I mean, to the, yes, to the U.S. doesn't make a lot of financial sense, so is Mexico the big winner? What's your take there? Uh, is, I mean, is this is something Daniel Martina Booth came up with that I listened to her a few days ago, and we were talking about this, but I think she's right. In terms of reshoring or other opportunities in emerging markets or outside of the U.S., demographically speaking, once we get past a global recession, countries like Mexico, India, um, they have a great demographics. So there's going to be opportunities there. Again, you'll have to wait and see where the, the signposts are, but in general, we've got to be looking outside the U.S. But I also think, you know, I grew up in Michigan before I went to set off to Germany and before I married a French woman, but, you know, I'm, I'm a patriot, I'm a Midwesterner, it's simple stupid, but I've seen what happened in the Rust Belt, they call it. You know, my grandfather worked at Ford, I saw what happened to Detroit, to Flint, the Midwest in general. I do think it's not only morally and professionally and uh, nationally essential, I think it's economically essential that, you know, when we 
when we outsourced the American dream in 2000, 2001 under Clinton, that we bring those jobs back. I think it still has to happen in America. I think whoever is in power, left or right, you know, red or blue, or anything in between, it's pretty axiomatic that you can't have GDP without P, without production. And uh, I'd like to see that actually come back instead of just being a service economy that inflates, uh, inflates its debt away with uh, a bogus currency. Now, is that an inflation driver, though? Because costs have to come up, paying American workers versus Mexican, Chinese, Indian, et cetera? Yeah. I mean, certainly, I mean, inflation drivers are going to be, to me, that's the Milton Friedman School. Inflation, to me, is ultimately about money supply. It's ultimately about currency. It's about what, what, whatever we sure, call sure, our sure. currency. Yeah. I don't see a gold-backed U.S. dollar in the next seven years. I just see a very different understanding of the value of that fiat peso, yuan, yuan, US, Canadian, Australian dollar. So again, when you're measuring your portfolio with a 20% return or an extra million or an extra 100 or an extra 1,000, it won't buy as much in seven years as it does today. And it certainly doesn't buy as much as it did seven, 10 years ago before. Yeah. And I'm not trying to be flippant, I'm not. A million dollars isn't what it used to be when, when that was the goal, to be a millionaire. For sure. And sadly, that's, you know, not again, trying to be flippant, but that's a sad world where a million isn't really much anymore. And yet, it's very important to think about that. Yeah, thank you, Matthew. Quick break here, guys. Today's episode is brought to you by Copernico Metals. Now, regular viewers of my channel will be familiar with the entrepreneur behind Copernico. His name is Ivan Bebek. Now, although a young man in this business, Ivan's already created tremendous value for his shareholders in the past, namely with Caden Resources, which he sold to Agnico Eagle, and Keegan Resources, which became a mine now owned by Galliano Gold. Now, Ivan has surrounded himself with expertise from BHP, Newmont, and Barrick on his board at Copernico Metals. Check out copernicometals.com. Now back to the interview. What people should invest in is themselves. People need to invest in their own education. When you talk about the whole panoply of risks out there, I think the most egregious risk that any of you face is located to the left of your right ear and the right of your left ear. There's a whole bunch of risks out there that scare the hell out of you that you can't do anything about. Mm. So I would suggest that you work on yourself before you worry too much about Trudeau or Biden or Trump, no matter how problematic they might be. I agree with these gentlemen that inflation seems to me to be the biggest macro risk in front of me. I also believe that there's a, a chance of a liquidity crunch uh, a recession, something like that. I'm not saying it's going to happen. I'm not smart enough to tell you. But I'm governing my own life being fairly cautious. Fairly cautious. In sectors anymore, I'm 70 years of age. I only do stuff I understand. Mm. So I understand conventional financial services. I'm building a bank. I like the community banks. Nobody else likes them, which is one of the reasons why I do. It's a good business, and they're stupidly cheap. I like property and casualty insurance. Again, it's a good business. Everybody hates it. So it's very, very, very cheap. Uh, if I had to pick one sector, perhaps because I know it well, but also because I like it, it's conventional energy. The big thinkers of the world tell you that peak oil demand is going to occur in 2030. I have no idea how these guys are going to fly all their private jets to Davos to tell you to drive less with no oil. But they think they're going to. And North American natural gas is cheaper yet. And you don't have to go way down the quality trail. You can do the Devons. You can do the Equitables. You can do high quality companies with 6 or 7% yields in a commodity that only can go up. If we have a recession, Jay, and I'm not saying we will, I'll leave that to the acro guys. You know, I'm just a used money salesman. But if we have a recession, and the whole commodity complex comes off a fair bit, then you can buy with impunity the Glencores, the BHPs, the Rios, the integrated major companies. And if you have the guts in a recession, uh, you can buy the penny dreadfuls with absolute impunity. I'm not saying you're going to have a recession. But if we do, come through this floor here. Uh, Pick people who've been successful before and just absolutely, positively fill your boots. People who know me know I love hate, and I think there's going to be a lot of hate in this decade. There's going to be a lot of stuff not to like. What don't people like now? People hate Africa. 
great resources, great demographics, an exploding middle class, human resources that people don't understand until they've been there. So I'm looking at Africa very, very carefully, both because it has fantastic potential and because people hate it. There's actually young folks in Africa. You know, the, the population doesn't look like us, damn near dead. Um, what else do people hate? Oh, they hate Muslims. So I like the Middle East and North Africa. For geology, I like that whole belt of rocks that goes from Turkey to Mongolia. I like it because it has great prospectivity, but I like it more because, you know, people say this, well, like they make these really intelligent investment decisions like Muslims are icky people. Uh, there's, nothing more that I, there's nothing I like more than ignorant hatred. And when people look at the Middle East, they're expressing the most vile form of ignorant hatred for a place that has lots and lots and lots of upside. That probably turned off the whole audience, but if it didn't, I have one more idea. I love water. Uh, bad pun, it's an illiquid asset. Uh, I've been investing in it for 35 years. I continue to buy very high quality American farmland, despite the fact that it's no longer cheap, where I can get in situ water rights. The price arbitrage in water between government controlled water, which I think will soon become available, and the utility of water in a broad market is the single dumbest commodity arbitrage on the planet. That doesn't play very well in Vancouver, where your challenge is to make water go away. But in other parts of the world where water is scarce and where people can afford it, uh, I would suggest to you that the single greatest pr price arbitrage on the planet, other than monetizing stupidity, uh, is in water.